Okay. Hey, everybody. It's wonderful to be back here again at ng-conf. I'm here to talk about animations. Uh, it's the key thing I work on on the Angular project. Uh, their link is right there for the slides. Don't worry, it's going to show up in another slide a bit later. So let's continue. Full screen. OK, full screen it is. <laughs> so I worked on the core team for four years now. And the thing I started off with was ng-animate. And that just, throughout the years, it's carried on to bigger and bigger challenges. And now with Angular 4 and 4.1 coming out, there's a lot of cool stuff to talk about. My website is yourvimo.com. It's a bit outdated. There's not much content on there. But there is a new design, and it looks pretty cool. Um, and of course, uh, let's talk about animation. So here's the links that I promised you. We have a full-fledged demo, which shows all of the new things coming. And when I say new things coming, it's within the next couple of weeks for 4.1. And there's a GitHub repo for the code, and of course, the slides. So what to expect from this talk? I'm going to stand here for 20 minutes and talk about animations. Um, Everything that you see here is for 4.1. The goal was to have things for 4.0, but the 4.0 API was final before this could get in. Therefore, it will be 4.1. It has been well tested for weeks, and the full-fledged demo showcases all these nice features. So setup. With Angular 4.0, we've introduced an Angular Animations module. Now, what this means is all of the animation-specific code is stored in this module. So that means that animations are completely separate from core now, but it isn't a breaking change. As long as you import your animations from there, they will work fine. And with 4.0, if you import them from core, they will still work. But the new features won't be there. Therefore, it is best that you import all of your animation methods from the Angular Animations module. And for this to actually activate into your Angular application, you will need to import the browser animations module and hook that up. And after that, you're back to where you were with Angular 2. The animations work the same way. However, there have been a ton of changes, not on the external API, but internally. There's been a huge refactor that's taken place. Animations are now 100% runtime handled, which allows for lots of cool things to be developed for them. So these animation modules that I mentioned, you have the browser animations module, and then you have the no-op animations module. The no-op animations module is useful for testing because it can disable the animations from running. However, it can still run the callbacks that are associated with the animation, so you don't have to change any of your application code. And when it comes down for people using system.js, now there's three bundles. I'm sorry that there's so many. <laughs> We're trying to break this up into a nice, reusable way. And if you are using System.js, please have all three of these bundles within your application. So basic example, for those of you who are new to how animations work in Angular 2, or Angular 4, sorry, um, let's do the hello world of animations, which is fade in and fade out. Here we have a div element that has a special property prefixed with an at symbol. At fade, animated in. If it's true, animate it out if it's false. And the button will toggle that animation from happening. Now, we need to register this at fade somewhere. And we do that within the component's animation metadata. We specify that the trigger with fade, when it's activated, it will target the animation to run through a transition. It can either go in, animate in, or animate out. What does the animation look like? Well, before we build the animations for that, Let's take all of the trigger code, put them into a separate file, so we can use that file later on. So we have fade animations being imported from a special file. And in that file, we have the trigger, which contains a transition for when it gets faded in. We animate from it being hidden to being visible over one second. And when it fades out, we go to opacity 0 over one second. Now, you don't need to put an opacity 1. Angular already knows that the opacity will be 1 or whatever value it was before the animation started. So oops. here, this is just a simple idea of how it works. I'll show 
We don't have to look at the code because it's very simple for fade in and fade out. However, we will make a nice tweak to this in a minute. Okay. Also, with these at symbol properties, you can have callbacks. You can detect when the animation has started and when it has finished. And the callback method that is called when that callback happens can accept an event property which contains details about the animation. Okay. So now let's go to the new stuff. First and foremost, we have a new variable, a new verb in animations called animation. And what this allows for is to have reusable animations. Yes, you can use TypeScript. Yes, you can import from a file. However, the actual contents of the animation will not be dynamic. And this allows for that to work. So transition can use it, and other animations can use other animations. And it is invoked by a verb called animate child. So let's go back to our fade animation code. And instead of having a trigger which has two transitions for fade in and fade out, and the transitions have the actual animation code, Let's just define a fade in animation and a fade out animation and reference those within our transition code. So when it fades in, we just call animate child on that fade in animation and fade out. OK, well, this is, this is really cool. It's a nice good start, but we don't see anything dynamic in here. And this is where input variables come in. Because what you can do is you can define input variables that are passed into an animation, and then the animation can consume those input variables. So if we go back to here, let's imagine that the fade in has a starting value that's dynamic and an ending value that's dynamic. What I've defined here as start is the user needs to provide the start variable and the end variable. If the user provides it, it will accept it. Otherwise, we'll use a default end variable of 1. And with the fade out, you can even change the duration. If you want it to run for longer or shorter amounts of time, you can override that by passing in animation data through animate child. So as you can see here, I am passing in start as 0, and then I'm passing in duration. But hold on. Duration is another variable which is interpreted by the transition. So. And how do you get data into a transition? Well. So far, what we've been doing is we've had string variables get passed into the animation triggers. And those string variables then, depending on what they are, to kick off the transition. But what you can do with Angular 4.1 is you'll be able to pass in an object. And in the object, you'll basically pass in the value of where it's going. And then any other input variables which will be interpreted in the animation itself. OK, query. This is the biggest feature that people have been asking for. And I've, sat here, I've stood here on stage before telling you that it's coming and it's coming. And with the recent refactor, now we've been able to finally do it. Let's take a look at a demo of Query in action. So this is the fancy demo, for those of you who have gone to the web page already, that includes all the nice new fancy animation bits. If I refresh the page, you can see that a variety of images are animating at different times. That is a query with a stagger across all elements within this page. If I click here, you can see that the inner contents have been selected with a query and a stagger and then animated. And if, for those of you who don't know what a stagger is, that means when you query multiple elements, there's a delay in between when each element starts its animation. So it's kind of like a nice curtain-like effect. So we have query and we have query all. Query selects one element, query all selects multiple. They all come back down to query selector. But in addition, we have other macros, such as enter and leave. We can detect for all the elements that have an active animation. We can search by animation trigger. There's all this extra stuff that we add on top of query selector. So with the demo code I just showed, with the container opening and closing, there was a title, there was paragraph tags. And when it became true, it would animate those contents. We have a reveal animation right here. And you'll notice the real reveal animation doesn't have an expression. It just has an, it just detects when the ngif is true and false. So continuing, when it is true, we have an enter animation that kicks in. Now what we want to do is we want to select the container the children, and animate both of those in parallel so we have a nice, smooth animation. 
So if we go over the steps here, first we style the container so that it is collapsed. Then we query all of its children and hide all the children. And then as a group animation, meaning in parallel, we animate the container and the children to become visible. So that brings us to our next feature, which is programmatic animations. Now, I've mentioned that we can have dynamic animations with variables, but I think the best thing would be if we could have an animation be defined directly within a component. So let's take a look at our next demo. Here I have an upload page. I click here, this modal pops up. I want to upload something. Let's say I want to upload background. Flips, you see this percentage indicator that's going across the screen? That animation is dependent on external data. It's dependent on the status of the upload. But you don't want to have CSS and change the CSS value when that's happening. Yes, that is possible. Yes, that works. But it would be nice if you could just define an animation and determine where it's going to go, or even the frame label, the frame where it is, programmatically from the component. This is possible using the animation builder. The animation builder is injected into the component and it allows you to build animations on the fly. And then you gain access to the player, which allows for things like scrubbing, speeding up and slowing down the animation, and detecting when the animation finishes. So you have the loading component in the demo that I just showed. It has a constructor that injects the animation builder. And then we have a method called start, given a percentage. Now, the start method will then take in the percentage, figure out what the width is based on that, and then produce a player. First, it produces a definition, and then it produces a player when we give the element. And we get back the player, which then allows us to have all kinds of nice methods on them to play and pause and change the position of it so scrubbing will become super simple. And of course, the player will persist on the page until you destroy it. All right. It's another big one, route animations. This feature has been asked as well, alongside query, time and time again. So if we think about routing, routing is a little tricky because by definition, it means you have two child routes and you have a parent route that controls them. So the way that we do this with Angular is that you gain access to the route outlet. The route outlet exposes its own directive. And that directive contains data about the active route, what's going on, did we click on a back button, uh, what page we're actually on. But it can also contain additional metadata that you provide within your routing. And then that metadata is passed into the transitions, and based on that metadata, you can decide what kind of animation you want to run. So this gives you full range of deciding what animations go in and out of the router animations. So this is what I was mentioning with the router outlet. You can see here that I have router animations. That's going to be an animation I'm going to define. But the value that's passed in there is a function that takes in the input parameter r, which is the outlet directive. So what does this input function do? Well, the input function will take in the outlet, figure out if it has an active route, and then examine its config. And based on that config, it can decide what animation it wants to run. So if we're on the index page, it has this animation config that, hey, okay, we're going to the home page. And we have an about page, it's going to the about page. But the cool thing about this is that you can pass in additional variables, which will be consumed within the animation. So if you want to have it when the user clicks the back button, you can have, you can have a, a value here called back, but then you can provide extra data in here, say, slide, or, uh, left 100 pixels. So it slides from the left of the page back to the center. All that data will then be consumed by the actual animation code. And then the actual transitions themselves are simple. We don't have to expand the animation API to support all these crazy router edge cases. We have, in this case, we have, when you go from the home page to the about page, run this particular animation. And you're able to animate things parallel. You can animate them sequentially. In this case, I want to animate the home page and the about page together at the same time. And then you can also have dynamically 
run routes where it doesn't know what route page has come in and what page has left, so you can just query it by enter and leave. These are the things that I was mentioning where we expand the nature of query selector to allow for additional things to be queried. All right, well, let's see what this looks like. <laughs> All right, so browsing around the web page, it has some nice smooth animations. I close this animation. Now, on the bottom, I have a bunch of links. We have about and home. What happens when I go to about? Well, it's going to deconstruct the page, animate it away, and animate the next page in with this fluid router API just by detecting the enter item and the removed item and delaying them when they need to be run. Thank you for the applause. And that is just about it. Here are the final notes for the slides. Remember, 4.1, we're just getting all of the APIs just to make sure that we're not doing anything crazy. Um, and uh, I believe I have an AMA, I think, tomorrow. I'll be happy to show more demos and to answer your questions. There's a lot of stuff that I missed in here, a lot of stuff coming with the 4.1 release of animations. And of course, thank you to the gang. Special thank you to Thomas and Elad. These guys helped me for the past 16 hours getting all these demos to work. These guys are awesome. And to Erica, Erica Luchfero, she designed the demo website, and she's helped me design other things. And of course, Ward, who helped me prepare for this talk as well. And the first guy, Rob, he used to work at Google. He's not here anymore, but me and him and Thomas, we all designed this nice new API. So everybody here deserves a super special thank you. And thank you for everybody here for watching this talk. Thank you.